Matthew chapter 19. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, that's chapter 18, he departed from Galilee and came to the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him. Multitudes are always surrounded Jesus. Because they could get something from Jesus. Multitudes weren't following him when he went to the cross. You know, the prodigal son had friends when he had money. When the money was gone, his best friend was a, was a pig. And he healed them there. The Pharisees also came on to him. So Jesus is involved in the ministry. And notice the Pharisees are always interrupting him. Tempting him. So here's a temptation. They're trying to lasso him up in his words. Said unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put his wife, put away his wife for every cause? Anything. And the thing is, if Jesus says yes, well, the standard thing is, you know, divorce ain't right. Though it happens. It breaks up the family. It destructs the children. It is just mind-boggling. And if he says no, well, what we're going to see in a moment is the law says yes. See, what they do is they try to pin Jesus in a question that whether he say yes, he's in trouble. Whether he says no, he's in trouble. And he answered, said it unto him. And a lot of people do that in the public ministry. They'll come up to you, you know, where King get his wife? How did all the animals get on the ark? And it, it's just trivial questions just to buy your time and waste your time. I've had it where I've been in the public street ministry and had one person just waste my time. By the time I realized I was wasting time, it, it, half the day has been gone. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female? Okay, we're going all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. We're in the law. Genesis is in the law written by Moses, by God on the mountain. In Exodus 21, 22. And notice how God made them male and female, no other classes. So we're going in the law in Genesis and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave, that means stick to, glue to. Today's word you put cleaver and use it to chop up meat. Cleave in the Bible is you stick to, you become one, your Velcro. And the twain shall be one flesh. That's kind of interesting, verse 5. Because verse 5, Jesus is quoting Adam. So, verses 4 and 5, Jesus says there is a book of Genesis. Jesus said that man has been created and he made him as male and female. And Adam is a real creature because Jesus just quoted him. That's what Adam says in chapter 2 when God brings his wife. And twain shall be one flesh. A marriage is one. It's not 50% her, 50% him. That's why she takes the husband's name. God called Adam and Eve both Adam. Adam named her Eve. Genesis 3 and Genesis 5. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. God called them Adam. Now it's interesting because now the next part of this verse 
is often quoted, especially by preachers in, in marriage ceremony. What Therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That's not church age doctrine. Paul says a Christian is not to have fellowship with an unsaved person. That's violating, that's, that's violating the Christian walk. If you're friends with an unsaved person and they disobey God and they don't like God and they haven't trusted in God, you have no business. Never mind a marriage to an unsaved person. A Christian is to marry a Christian. That's Bible, that's church. So you're going to tell me you're going to have two Catholics, two Mormons, two Jehovah Witnesses, two atheists, two scientists, two Scientologists, two Buddhists. God joined them together. They're not even God's children. They're Satan's children. You are your father, the devil. The only way you become God's child is through faith and belief in Jesus Christ alone with the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. The context in verse 4, the context in verse 5, the context in verse 6 is Adam and Eve. You're not going to say, if you've got a, 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 a man and a woman, and either or is saved, and either or, the opposite, is lost, or either or is a, 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 a dedicated Baptist saved, and the other one is re religious, not saved. God didn't put them together because God told Paul to write a Christian and a Christian. Even then you can't get two Christians to agree. You realize the Baptists have are the ones that have the more church splits? You don't get two Catholics battling it out. They can't because the Catholics have such a Nicolaitan and say uh, rules and regulation tradition. Cross it, and you know you're going to go to hell, and you're not ever going to be by, blessed by the Pope. And the more you know, if you don't believe the Mormon doctrine or everything like that, you're not going to go out of place and get yourself a little planet. And then the Jehovah Witnesses, you won't be one of the 144,000, even though now you're up to, what, 11 million people? But God does state a marriage, and in Paul's it states a marriage is your one. Paul will even go, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 7, Paul would even go and say, you know what, I'd rather have you be like me. Either a widow, Paul was, or Paul was not married at all. Now, we're going to read something about that. I'm not that type. I want to be married. If you don't want to be married and you want to serve God, Paul, uh, Paul speaks about that in 1 Corinthians 7. He said, hey, listen, if, if you're a man or you're a woman, you don't want to marry because you want to give yourself and all of yourself and all your money and everything you have. You don't want to buy presents for the wife and you don't want to buy presents for the husband. You don't want the wife to interfere in, in the men's fellowship and you don't want the man to interfere in the woman's fellowship. Don't marry. But if you want to marry, you have not violated the scriptures. You are not in violation of God. But Paul even said, you're going to have trouble. When Paul says you're going to have trouble, that means you're going to fight. Sometimes that fighting causes a little separation. Paul, Paul speaks about a separation, not a divorce. If you can't get along, it'd be better if you just go off, settle down from each other, get things right. And he's not saying divorce. He's saying, listen, a legal separation. Just maybe you need to get away from each other once in a while. But you stay together and you try to work it out. That's Paul. 1 Corinthians 7, I believe it is. Jesus is talking about a man named Adam and a woman that was named by her husband, Eve. Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3. There's no church. It is blasphemy for a preacher to get up there, two unsaved or unsaved and a, and a, and a saved individual, and let not God 
divide asunder, but God is joined that he not put asunder. Alright. If God has joined them, let them not be put asunder. Look at 1 Corinthians 7. This came to mind. What are you going to do with this verse when Paul talks about the church age? Okay. All right. Look at this one. Let me find where it is. It's all about marriage. 1 Corinthians 7. Look at verse look at verse 15. 1 Corinthians 7 15. I didn't have this in my notes. We're here. God, God said, Jesus said, what Adam said. I'm joined to this woman, Eve and I are one. Jesus said, God said about Adam and me, but God has joined together. God brought them two together. God introduced them. And they became married. And said, let, no, let no one interfere with Eve and Adam. Look at verse 15 of chapter 7, verse 9. For if the unbelieving depart. All right, here's, here's a man and woman. They're both lost. One of them gets saved. The one that is lost in that marriage, if the unbelieving depart, if the lost man departs, or most lost woman depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister saved is not under bondage in such cases. God calls a marriage between a saved and an unsaved individual, he calls it bondage. And if you're both married before Either one or both are are, mar are saved, and after you're married, and one of you becomes saved, the other one says, "Listen, I ain't dealing with this church free. I ain't dealing with this Jesus free. I'm not dealing with the Bible. I'm not dealing with church. I don't want to hear it. I'm leaving you." God says, "Bye." That's what Paul says. But God has not called, for God has called us to peace. There will be a hostile situation in a lost and saved relationship. And that, that woman, that guy is going to say, well, you know, if I get him married, I'll change him on that. That's a bunch of bull. Don't fall for that lie of Satan. Because the world operates in the lowest com common denominator, the, the evil victory is over. And the saved person in that relationship will be probably discarded by the roadside. Typically, not a rule. But back in Matthew 19. So, when you hear, therefore God has joined together, let no man... Put a Sunday, you're at a, you're at a Baptist wedding, and you hear a preacher say it. Uh, call to mind Adam and Eve. Okay. And then think about all the people you know that are saved, married to a lost person, and it's just a symbol. You cannot have Christ and God together. But that's the lie of the scene in church age. They were, they're hot and they're cold. They're hot and they're cold. They're lukewarm. You can't have a lukewarm marriage. Then they said unto him, Why did Moses command to give a writing a divorcement to put her away? So why did, why did Moses put in the law, you can divorce, and is it there, Deuteronomy 24? Let's go read it. Because Moses did write it, and it didn't say God did, it said Moses did. The law was written by Moses after the time that Moses broke the law, the first time, when he got down the mountain and they were giving to all their, their things to the cow that can't spell chicken. And they were doing the Baptist fellowship. 
I, I was my reading today is the seven churches, and I went through. I think it's Smyrna where the, where the where the Jezebel, and the, the Christians are taking part in the eating of the sacrifice to idols and all. And I put my note right next to that that verse that I say the Baptist Catholic or the Catholic Baptist because that's when it began. And that's why there's so much Catholicism in the Baptist church today, because Jezebel was allowed to come in. And the only one that defiled Jezebel was Elijah. And he got such a run. He ended up getting uh, depression. Deuteronomy 24, 1, when a man has taken a wife and married her. And come, knows the, the wife become before the marriage. Jacob, I mean, uh, Isaac was, took Rebekah into his mother's tent and he, she became his wife. There was no ceremony. There was no preacher. Do you take this mother to be a brother? I do. Do you take this mother? I do. There was none of that. When his flesh joined her flesh, they were married, and when Jesus dealt with that woman who had four husbands, and the one you're with right now is not your husband, well, how can it be her husband if it's not your husband? They were having intercourse. I don't care what your Baptist... Listen, if your Baptist preacher or your Baptist friend disputes that, they got some skeletons in the closet somewhere. And what they hide behind, well, I only had one marriage ceremony with one preacher. One license. Don't talk about anybody else who's been in the closet. Come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. Because he has found some uncleanness in it. Now if you see, stay there in chapter 19. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? They know what the, Moses said. Moses said, she... One of her eyelashes doesn't look good. I, I don't like it. He wakes up in the morning with her and finds out her, what she looks like without the makeup. She gets in the morning and, ah, who are you? I'm your wife. <laughs> you find un unclean. She don't clean the house. She don't do this. Because he has found some uncleanness in her. Then let him write her a bill of divorce. There it is. Anything. Give her a divorce. And give it to her hand and send her out of his house. Look at that. Right there. And if she departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. That's, that's important. In the law of Moses... The law of the Jews, of the Hebrews. There's divorce and there's remarriagement after a divorce. Now, Jesus is going to put another clause in back to Matthew. But you cannot go, all right, for Christians, because we're not dealing with Christians in Matthew. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 is like, if two Christians marry and one depart, you're separated. That's it. You're, you, you, there's no there's to be no divorce. There's a separation. And we do have accounts of marriage where you can have a separation. And you get things fixed up. You get things right. Then you come back into the marriage. And you will have to do some kind of legal paperwork and all that. But, but not a divorce. But we read in 1 Corinthians 7 that if an unsaved individual tells the Christian, I'm done with you, God says, bye. You can go get married if you want to now. Because that marriage of an unsaved and saved person is bondage. Marriage is designed by God. I hate anybody who ranks on marriage, makes fun of marriage, jokes about marriage, jokes about the wife, jokes about the husband. You married each other. Marriage. God gave Adam a job. Go in the garden and dress it. That was before the fall. 
God gave man a second thing. He gave him a woman to be his wife. That was before the fall. And I believe in my heart. I'm going to say there rings a melody. In my heart, I believe, and I don't think I'm wrong with I think if you rank and make fun of marriage and joke about it, I think God's going to hold you accountable because marriage is an institute of God. And don't get me connected with, with the Pope and the Catholic Church, though they do have something right. Jehovah Witnesses got something right. The, the honor and rage of the flag is idolatry. And I just lost a whole bunch of Baptists. I don't care. You are treating that flag as a god. Now, I believe everybody should do military duty. I believe uh, for a male to come out of high school, to get his high school diploma, I believe he should be opted to go into the military regardless, unless medical condition. I think every male in America should do four years of military. You can choose which one or the government will choose. It's good for you. something you need. I, I think... I think the Jehovah Witnesses and uh, 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 the Quakers there, I think it's the Quakers, one of the, I think you should be exempt from all taxes and all, everything like that, government programs, because they don't believe in, you know, we're passive, we don't believe in war. Come on, you never fought with your wife? You never fought with your neighbor? You never fought with a co-worker? Jesus had fights with them. But, we're moving on. He says, Moses, because the hardness of your hearts suffered you to put away your wife. So the reason why Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 is there is because you're just a wicked, wild man. You can't hold to the institution of marriage for a lifetime. Because you found some uncleanness. I mean, you found that when she goes potty, she stinks. You got to get out of this house, lady. Or man. You found out that she gets sick, and it's going to be a lot of money, a lot of time. and all. Listen, uh, one of my wives went in the hospital with cancer. The nurse told me, she says, you won't believe the divorce rate. I don't know how we got Thing, but you know, you learn a lot of things in the hospital. She says, you won't believe the divorce rate when, when one party, especially the wife, is in a hospital bed. She's been diagnosed with cancer. It's terminal. And you see the husband come in, or the lawyers will come in and say, uh, these are the papers for divorce. My first wife, Lisa, I went with every doctor with her. I went to every time she could. To be with her, like the things I couldn't, like the radiation and the chemotherapy, I I could go in there until it was ready to set her up, and then I had to leave. Some husbands don't want to do that. We had a we had a husband here in Florida. I wasn't a Florida resident then. I was in Connecticut, but you know he had a wife that was a uh, um, hospital care, and he wanted to put her to death. The family didn't want to put her to death. And, you know, he just happily had a girlfriend. Supposedly now Florida has a law. And I don't understand all that stuff. So that's why I have a living will. So when it comes to the fact is, when it comes to special medical, you're not doing it to me. Just put me out. Don't fight over it. It's in my, my yeah, you hear it right now, the thing is in my lockbox. I have a living will. Regardless if I remarry and regardless whatever she wants, she wants me to. My thing is, if I'm on a machine and that's my life, no, it's, it's just pull the plug. Don't have her pull the plug because I'm in the hospital and I, I'm given some kind of medical condition. You know, it's, it's term is going to be many or whatever it is. Don't have her kill me just because she don't want to put up with the bills. She don't want to put up with the aggravation. That's wrong. But the law of Moses, which the church is not under the law, unless you bring up tattoos and women wearing what pertains to a man, a man, man pertains to a wife. You know, you bring that up in the church. And, you know, the tattoos, you bring that up in the church. But we're not under the law. 
Oh, the law says you're not supposed to rank on your leader. You're not supposed to make fun of them. The law says you're not to, to violate by proclaiming the gods of the heathen, like Esther and Taman and Satan, the jack-o'-lantern. Why don't you, as a creature, why don't you read what jack-o'-lantern story is? Because there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that story. So he says, But from the beginning, it was not so. Okay, go, let's go back to Adam and Eve. When he joined Adam and Eve together, there was to be no divorce. And listen, if Adam ever had a choice to divorce a wife, God, look what she did. She brought sin and misery and discomfort. What about if Adam did not eat that fruit and she ate that fruit? That would be a great cause for Adam to say, hey, I want to get away from that woman. But it was not so. And I'm tr maybe I'm maybe I'm reading into this too much. But from the beginning it was not so. From and I'm probably reading too much into it. But from the beginning it was not so. God never intended I could say this. Husband and wife ever to separate. Is it taking one fact that there has not been a divorce since Adam and Eve to now the law? I think I'm stretching that. The very fact is that Moses had to put it in the law and there were people thinking about it. But, you know, if you committed adultery, you went straight to hell. If you violated the Sabbath, you went to hell. You divorced your wife. She just moves on. And there wasn't even a sacrifice for it. Did you see that? There was no lamb, no cow, no... You, you, you give her a bill of divorcement, and you say, get out of my house, see you later, don't come back. And the law said for her not to come back if she remarried, and her second husband, which the Bible says she could have, if he divorces her, she can't go back to the first husband. God honors the second marriage more than he does the first. Now, the thing is, now, now people know I've been married twice. My second wife, she was divorced. And the fact is, I told her, I, said, I asked for the conditions of the divorce. She told me that her husband had cheated on her. Her husband had committed adultery. I'm going to show you why that's an important moment. I was kicked out of the church because you're, you're married, a, a woman's getting divorced. Well, according to her, it's biblical grounds. No, 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 blasphemy. Go straight to hell, don't pass go. Can't even have the blood of the lamb. Don't confess that one. Well, okay, what are you going to do with what Jesus said? Though Paul does not talk about divorce, Paul, when he's talking to Christians, divorce is not even to be evident. But there are plenty of people under the, the preaching of a preacher, oh, 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 you're, going, you're in trouble for divorce, don't you divorce? And most of his congregation has been divorced and remarried. Hypocrite. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, divorce. Now you guarantee, now the, the Pharisee eyeballs this lit up. We got him. We nailed him. Yes. And remember, there's a multitude there. He's got, they got a multitude of people. The, the law says two or three is a witness. They got a whole multitude what Jesus is going to say right now. Whether shall a man put away his wife, verse 9, except it be for fornication. Now, I know a preacher will run to, Matt, to run to Mark. 
He'll bypass Matthew, run to Mark. Mark does not give you separate fornication. Mark leaves you a divorce. It's a sin. And he does. Matthew, <laughs> now Matthew said, except for fornication. If the man's wife has had sexual relations with another man, that man has the option by Jesus to put her away. He can write in that marriage, which most Christians will say. Hey, get things right. Forgive. It's going to be hard to forget that one. We just talked about that in chapter 18. It's kind of hard, I would think, that if your spouse has cheated on you and you choose, I'm going to forgive you. I would think sometimes in the marriage bed, I would think sometimes you'd be turn around and think, well, you were doing this to a, somebody else. <laughs> you have been unpure to me. And don't tell me that Satan will not throw that into a Christian marriage. If you forgive from the heart, which we talked about last night, okay. What do you do if, if, if at one period of time, for some stupid reason, somebody had your arm chopped off? Machinery, you're doing something stupid, and, and you lost your arm. And that guy comes up to you in the hospital and says, listen, I, that was stupid. And I, I, I'm sorry. I, oh, man, what, what, what can I do? I'll pay the hospital bill, whatever it is. I, you know, I'll take you to the point. And he said, yes, I forg forgive you. Great. And then when you get home and the healing and everything like that, and you want to go to write something and you're right-handed, <laughs> kind of hard to forget. Because <laughs> if you're right-handed and you lose your right arm, oh, Bob, listen, Bob, I forgive you. It was truly an accident. It was, part, it was your fault and my fault. <laughs> But when I use a computer, uh, he's going to have to use a computer where he's got to talk to the computer. And I've used some of those programs, and sometimes when you're, I mean, if you've got dentures, the, the computer does not read what, actually what you say. And then you got frustrated, go back and erase that. I don't know how many programs I had where you speak to the computer, and then they're like, this ain't going to work. Bob, what'd you do with my... <laughs> I can't imagine. Can you imagine that prodigal son's father? The kid's left, he's gone. Can you imagine him sitting out that porch praying to God, saying... And then son comes and forgives him and all that, and just think, you know, you ruined my life there for a while. You caused me to worry. You got me upset. That's one thing between marriage of a husband and wife and a parent of a child is there are things, you know what, you can forgive, but there was a bit one event in Lisa in my life. I'd done to her, she forgiven me for it, and there were times she would bring it up. Everything she forgave me for it, but she didn't forget. Women are great for that. Now, I'm not picking on women. I'm just saying women are great for that. For whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for corn. It doesn't even give the idea that the wife can do it. The husband. All right. So he allows the divorce of a wife who's committed adultery. And he divorces her. Not by the law, but what Jesus said. And he marry another, shall marry, we're talking about the husband. 
He goes. He puts his wife away because she committed. She was unfaithful to him in marriage. He puts her away, and he goes marries another. Committed adultery with rightful grounds for a divorce, and you decide, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get. I'm going to be remarried. You are committing adultery. Though Jesus said it is a proper divorce. We're still under the law. There is no suffering. There is no death. There is no burial and no resurrection of Jesus Christ. And under the law of adultery, you went to sin. You went to hell. Unless you are in some kind of transition here. <clears throat> that the Gospels of the life and ministry of Jesus, there is something unexplainable going on. Because Jesus will go and say, I think it's John, Gospel of John. The law and the prophets were to John, John the Baptist. Well, what do you do with John the Baptist? To the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You got the life ministry of Jesus. You realize in the life ministry of Jesus, it looks like no one died. Anybody that died, they were resurrected. If you had physical ailments of your body beyond Anybody, any doctors help to help you. Jesus came along and healed you. But remember, he's addressing the Pharisees with the, 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 the multitude listening. And whosoever marries her, the one that committed adultery... Well, Jesus already said in John chapter 4, that woman with four husbands has already been married. What happened is, well, that wife, when she stepped out on her husband, she got herself another husband. The one she had the extramarital affair, adultery or fornication. She has two husbands. And God doesn't acknowledge the first marriage no more because she was unfaithful to her first husband. Now she's got two husbands. And whosoever marries her, whether it be the one she had fornication with, or she finds somebody else, now she's got three husbands if it's not the one she fornicated with. But she really don't have three because God did not honor the husband she had that she was unfaithful to. So she would have two husbands, but really three husbands. And this man, listen, what are you going to do if you have an 18 year old, well, I make it 20 year old Christian male? And he's married. And his wife steps out of him. And he decides, you know what? I can't forgive her. Matter of fact, there is no forgiveness because she keeps doing it. I'm doing the divorce there, grounds of Jesus Christ. Are you telling me at 20 years old, the rest of that man's life is to be a eunuch? But we're going to talk about eunuchs. But wait a minute. Let's go to church age doctor. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 7. Let's read what Paul says to the Christians. Verse 1. It's now concerning things thereof. I wrote unto you, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Paul keeps on saying, hey, don't get married. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, you do not have premarital sex. <coughs> How do you prevent premarital sex? Let every man has his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. That prevents premarital sex.
There it is. And here's the place. I thought it was first Corinthians. Oh, look at verse 9. But if they cannot contain, in other words, the relationship is getting hot and heated. They yearn for each other. Let them marry. For it's better to marry than burn, and that's not hell. That's a burn of passion and love and you got to the point, listen, if you don't get married, you're gonna have for, you're gonna fornicate. Paul says in that case, if you got to that point that you have the hots for her, she has the hots for you, you better get married. Are you telling me that twenty year old man whose wife has stepped out of are you telling me for the rest of his life he can't have a wife? If he finds a good Christian woman that will be faithful to him, and if he even has, maybe has children, but uh, how about he's twenty years old? He finds a nice Christian woman in the church, and they get together, and they really love each other, and they really want. Uh, you're going to have a pastor step up to it, and it has happened. No, you can't marry her because you've been divorced. I've had people tell me I am married to two women. When, when my second wife was still alive. When my first wife was dead. And Paul will go say, 1 Corinthians 7, if, if your spouse dies, you, the law of marriage has ended. The law of marriage. Paul says the law of marriage. What did the law say in Deuteronomy? If you don't like her any cause, divorce her. Jesus says, let me add one little conclusion to that in his life ministry. It better be for fornication. There's a cause in Florida and there's a cause in Connecticut. No fault divorce in Connecticut. Whatever reason, you don't even have to give a reason. You don't you want a divorce, just get one. From, from one of the states that say, hey, you want abortion? Come on into our state. We'll take care of you. Back to Genesis. I mean Matthew. So Shall marry another commit his adultery. Okay, that's what Jesus said. But Jesus said that the law and the prophets ended with John the Baptist. We, in the ministry of Jesus, from his baptism to the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, you are in a dispensation of what? You can't say they went to Abraham's bosom or they went to hell because no one died. How's that one? You say, well, you know, there's only three or four resurrections in the Bible, in the gospel time. Did not Jesus send his disciples out and one of the things was to raise the dead? There was a woman who was in a funeral procession with her son in the beer, the, 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 the coffin. He stopped the whole possession and raised the child to life. And that carries out to the book of Acts. Unto the conclusion of the canon of scriptures of the 66 books. That is definitely salvation by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that shows up with the Ethiopian eunuch and even uh, Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching to Israel. He mentions the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So we are on a touch, touchy subject, and you got to realize the one who's saying it is, what are they trying to protect? Are they trying to protect the scriptures? Or are they trying to protect the fact is they've had a loose zipper in their past and that they've had only one documented legal in the city hall records marriage. But before that, 
and maybe even after that, their zipper has been open. And that the skeletons in the closet is they got more than one legal right. You know, there are pastors that go to pastor fellowships and they go out to the bar, they go out to the strip club, they get the triple X rated uh, movies, but they pay for them before they leave the hotel. Yeah, a pastor's conference. I've heard pastors tell me. Don't think you're a pastor. I'm not saying all of them, but you know, some of the pastors out there don't think they're clean and holy living. When I got saved in 1987, the biggest thing was pastors were running away with the with the piano player. That I don't know that, that stopped. But what do you do with the Southern Baptist Church when there's many open zippers? What do you do with that pastor? I forget where it was. Uh, he's having sex with an underage woman in his office on the floor multiple times. And he expects the whole congregation to forgive him, and he keeps the pulpit. No. And whoso remarries her, which is put away, she's been divorced, committed adultery. She's already committed adultery. And Whoso marries her also commits adultery would conclude that it's not the man she was fornicating with. It's another man. It's an innocent man. And now he's involved in adultery. And he may not ever know about her sexuality. But now he's an adulterer. Two men are involved in adultery because of one woman who is unfaithful to her husband. What do you do with that whole statement? What do you do as a Christian? I married another woman because my wife was unfaithful. Or maybe I married another man because I was unfaithful. What do you do with that statement, Matthew 19, 9? That's not church age. What do you do with that statement? Let me show you what you do. 1 John 1, 19. 1 John 1, 9, not 19. You have to get another version of the Bible, get verse 19. If we confess our sins, is adultery a sin? Yes, it is. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And maybe you, maybe you committed adultery full knowing well. And then you have a broken heart over it. And if we confess our sins, and this would be from the heart, First John 1, 19. You come to God with a broken, contrite heart. You have sinned. Though in the law adultery is, there is no forgiveness. He is faithful. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Adultery. What we're talking about tonight, when we get to lying and stealing and, and, and uh, not honoring your parents and uh, lying and stealing, uh, the, the, the idols and imagery. And we get to the Ten Commandments outside the, the, the Sabbath. We will come back to 1 John 1, 9, but the adultery. If we confess our sins, adultery is a sin. You will find in the writings of Paul, adultery is sin. What do you do if you're unsaved and you, you have committed adultery? And you come to Christ for the very first time. Okay, I'll save you, but adultery, no, I can't save you from that. That's some of the things you get from these preachers. I'll save you from every sin, but adultery. That's not the case. If we confess our sins, no mention of sins, no loophole. If we confess our sins, plural, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what's a Christian do when he gets involved in adultery and repents? He 
Okay, uh, this one I'm going to have to do this one real quick. This just came to me now. So let's see. Okay. Go to 1 Corinthians. Look at this one. First, first Corinthians 5 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much named among the Gentiles. No, even the Gentiles don't do this. That one should have his father's wife. Whoa, there's a fornication of a wife. The wife is fornicating with the son. You know, and that's happened all, all the time today. And Paul goes on to say, that man is guilty. That man should be de-churched. You know what happens in 2 Corinthians? I, I, I don't know the chapter and all that. I didn't look it up there. You know what happens in 2 Corinthians? That guy comes back in the congregation. He repents to God. He gets right with God. God forgives him. Paul says to the church, all right, bring him in. Forgive him. Help him. The law would say, stone him. 2 Corinthians, love him. Bring him back in. And forgive him. But keep an eye on him. <laughs> Make sure he don't go about messing with any other, anyone else's wife. Prove him. That's, that's proper and righteous. What do you say with that in the church age doctrine of the Corinthians? Guys involved in fornication? Paul says, de church him. Kick him out. Turn him over to Satan. That's verse number. Oh. Verse 5, 5 5. Turn him over to Satan for destruction. Let Satan beat his butt. Let Satan kill him. That way he will go to the judgment seat of Christ with that one wicked sin rather than wicked sins, wicked sins, wicked sins. But he corrects himself. He confesses to God. He gets right. Ends that relationship. And he comes to the pastor of the church and says, Listen, I have truly forgiven my God. I have brought, I have confessed, I have with my heart. I am sorry. I will come before the church. I will tell you what I did. I will confess and ask you to forgive me. <coughs> the church epistles say, You're to forgive him. The law says, Stone him. But back to Matthew, chapter 19, what's Jesus say? Verse 9, you're an adulterer. And, <laughs> and what? The law didn't say you were an adulterer when you went and remarried. Because you were given a door. Jesus says you're a adulterer, and he does not say stone you. He just says you have a new title. You have a new name. You're a adulterer. And you could walk around and say, oh, there's Zebedee. He's an adulterer. Well, his wife had cheated on him. They divorced. He chose to divorce her. He married Sarai. <laughs> And they're both adulterers. <laughs> you don't stone them. <laughs> well, they can't bring a sacrifice. Uh, about 40 or so more years, there will be no place of sacrifice when Titus comes in 70 A.D. And there will be no place for sacrifice after Titus comes. <laughs> Did you think about that? 27 years, I think it is, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, 
the temple where they brought their offerings, their cows, their sheep, their goats, will be destroyed. And it will not be built to the Antichrist. There's something about Matthew 9 that it's 19 verse 9, I mean. There's just something there. That we know the future. We know the history that is yet future for this time. His disciples said unto him, oh boy, here we go. If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Now, that statement, is it the very fact is don't get married in the first life like Paul was saying? Or is he? Or are they talking about remarriage? What if that man's 20 years old, I said? Listen, a man 20 years old, he's, he's in his prime. He takes second look at women. Jesus said in chapter 5, man looking upon a woman lusts after his heart, he's committed adultery with her. That guy's in double jeopardy. Just looking at a woman, he's committed adultery. Now if he remarries, he's committed adultery. And the disciples say, well, you know, it's good that he don't remarry. <laughs> that poor fellow. <laughs> But he said unto them, Jesus, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it's given. Not, not every man is going to get married. So the question was, the disciples say, it's just good that we never get married. Do you know a disciple that's with them that you know is married? Peter, the first pope. Can you imagine now Peter kicking a rock? What are you guys talking about? I'm married. And you don't know about the other disciples. But Peter is married, and as far as he didn't speak up. This, this is a place where you would think that Peter, the married Pope, would, uh, excuse me, guys, you're going to condemn me? Because I am married. I wonder where Peter was. For there are some eunuchs, and a eunuch is a surgery. It's not, there are some that restrain themselves. No, they have a surgical procedure. Like you take your dog or kitty male to the vet, and they give them an operation, and they can't have kittens or puppies no more. I, I forget whether it's the Chinese or Japanese. I forget which one. They would actually remove all the private parts of a male. And they would eventually die because they could not urinate. This would be the case of the male testicles. And would it be, listen, Daniel was made a eunuch. They gave him a surgery. Because you don't mess with the kings and the royal women. So there are some who are born of their mother's womb. So by birth, there are some males who are unable to produce children. I know a few men like that. I know some women, I know it's not called, but there are some women who can't produce children. But we're talking about the male. They, from their birth, they are barren. There are some eunuchs which are made eunuchs of men. Daniel, Shadrach, Eshach, and Bendigo were made eunuchs by Babylon. So they could not make Jewish Babylonian babies. They couldn't mess with the royal line of the Babylonians. 
And there were many because there was even a master of the eunuchs. And that's a lot of things back then what the armies did. When they took captives, the first thing they do was they castrated the males. Like I said, it was the Chinese or Japanese, I forget who. They went a little bit one step too far. Then there'd be eunuchs which had made themselves eunuchs in the kingdom of heaven. They went and had surgery for God and his kingdom. Kingdom of heaven, their birds, their trees, their cows, their bumblebees. You can't say the kingdom of God because they're not given to marriage in the kingdom of God. And usually the kingdom of heaven's sake is they are in the millennium. Well, I know who they are. They're the 144,000. Have you ever had a Jehovah Witness come to your house and we're, you know, we're the 144,000 and they got their child? How did that happen? That's just as worth you got a woman Jehovah Witness. Uh, it says all males. Those 144,000 are eunuchs of their own choice for God. I forget what they call that surgery in America where the male goes and has... And it's, it's not... I don't know how they... You don't cut nothing off, I don't think. But there is a surgery. Maybe they do. I don't know. He that is able to receive it. Okay, this, this answer to what they said. Let him receive it. All right. If you're given the power to find a wife and marry, marry her. But that's not the case with every man. 